This video has been sponsored by Palm Team Capital. Real people, real returns. Visit us at www.palmteamcapital.com. So welcome, right. everybody. Today, I'm going to cover a, or do a very thorough case study on Adobe, where I'm going to perform a detailed analysis on that company. But before I continue, we'd like to go through our legal disclaimer. Those of you who are watching, who watch a recording of it, please pause this video and read this very carefully. But here, this, here are some of the highlights you're going to read. So this presentation is for informational purposes only and is not an offer to provide any investment advisory services. Past performance and recommendations of any Palm Team Foundation's principles is not a guarantee of future success. And it's being furnished to those people who are accredited investors, qualified clients, and or qualified purchasers, and may not be used or reproduced. The material is not intended to represent the rendering of accounting, tax, legal, or regulatory advice. So with that said, let's get going. So the analysis that I'm going to share with you today is the same analysis that our investment management company, which is Palm Team Capital, performs. And this is how that company finds high quality companies to invest in through its hedge fund. And I will use Palm Team Capital's fact analysis process that the Palm Team Capital has donated to our foundation so that we can teach it to everyone. And this way, you too will learn how to analyze companies. So what is Adobe? So Adobe is an American software company, and it's known for its multimedia and creativity software. And Adobe has over 100 products in its portfolio, and it can be broken down into really three categories. And you can go to Wikipedia, find all this information. You can go on Adobe's website, find all this information. But what are these three categories? These are number one, Adobe Digital Media. And Adobe Digital Media segment offers creative cloud services, uh, which allows members to actually download and install the latest versions of their products, such as Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, Adobe Premiere Pro, uh, Adobe Lightroom, Adobe InDesign, as well as utilize other tools such as Adobe Acrobat. And I bet almost everybody here is familiar with some Adobe product, like Adobe Acrobat, for example, PDFs, et cetera, right? Like I use them. I even use uh, Adobe Photoshop for the graphics that I make or or these video editing that I do that I place on uh, on YouTube or on Palm Team Foundation's website. They all, I use Adobe. So that's what comes under the Adobe digital digital media category. The second category is called the Adobe Digital Experience Cloud. So you can create custom marketing experience. And many of you may not even know this. So you ha they have products that you can use to create custom market experiences for your customers with very easy drag and drop software. And you can reach customers one on one. And Adobe has many automation capabilities that would otherwise require large number of developers. You can tailor your marketing efforts to all your customers on every channel and device in minutes. So you can have something that's immediately going on an iPhone or a tablet or look different on desktop. All that can be done on the fly. You can make microsites on the fly, implement Internet of Things. So what are Internet of Things? These are things like, you know, capabilities like you got your fridge and you want things to happen there or show up there. That's Internet of Things. Um, and this is also on the cloud, which means that companies are all the companies that use this capability are always on. There's no downtime. They also have native artificial intelligence to automate tasks through their business tools. So chat GTP is not the only game that's playing uh, AI. These companies, a company such as Adobe is actually quite advanced in utilizing artificial intelligence in, in capabilities that are relevant to what they do. Um, Adobe also has its own content management set system within this Adobe digital cloud experience. Uh, it has digital asset management system, enrollment forms, cloud services, and even a learning management system. Right? Again, I, I don't think many of you even know this, but they have this and they're being used. The next category of software that Adobe has is called Adobe Publishing and Advertising. And what is that? It's essentially a cross-channel platform which offers customers the ability to plan, buy, manage, measure, analyze, and optimize advertisements uh, campaigns related to display, video, native, mobile, audio, search, and even connected TV advertisements. And it uh, it has it leverages dynamic ad templates to deliver relevant ad content to end users. So it's actually quite advanced. And a lot of uh, uh, popular advertisement companies or digital media companies, they utilize the software of Adobe. 
Here's a chart that shows the historical performance of, performance of the revenue of Adobe since 2011, broken by quarters, and it separates them based on the different segments that I mentioned. So digital media, digital experience, and publishing. So bring my laser pen. So this blue represents digital media, the orange represents digital experience, and the black on the top represents uh, publishing and advertisement. So you notice how it has actually been consistently growing, and it's kind of like an exponential growth, not just a linear growth. And the digital media encompasses or accounts for 72%, 73% of uh, Adobe's revenue. Digital experience accounts for, uh, here, digital media accounts for 25%, whereas uh, the publishing and advertising accounts for 2% of its revenue. Now, the revenue also comes from uh, different geographies. So which are these geographies? Well, the strongest is in the North America, which is 58%, or the Americas, I should say, 58%, followed by Europe and the Middle East, which is 26%, and the last in this is, the, uh, is Asia. So now that we understand the different segments, revenue proportion of those segments, and the geographical locations where the revenue is coming from, let's explore the company in detail through Palm Team Capital's fact analysis. And this is the same analysis that Palm Team Capital performs in its own hedge fund, and you too can learn it and understand the rigor that goes into selecting companies they invest in. But the beauty is, once you go through this process and you found a good quality company that meets the, uh, the standards, the, and you've done the technical analysis to identify when you should uh, buy the stock. Once you invest in it, you can basically rest with peace thing, thinking that, hey, my money is in a good quality company because institutional investors, hedge fund owners, we don't invest based on a tip from somebody sitting in a bar. No, we do our own analysis and you too can learn it. It's not tough. So uh, I'm gonna go through that analysis in uh, using Adobe. So what is fact analysis? Remember I've taught you, or those who, those of you who've attended my webinars, fact analysis consists of four items within it, which stands for, F stands for financial analysis, A stands for advantage over competition, C stands for calculation of intrinsic value, and T stands for technical analysis. So we do all of these in this sequence to find out how is this company really performing? And is it worth my, worth my investment? And remember, investment and trading are different, right? Investment is for long run. You put your money, you become a part owner in a company. Hence, you want to become a part owner of a good quality company. And you're you're with it for a long period of time. Trading, on the other hand, is buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. So a lot of people get confused. They, they think they're investing when they're really trading. I'm talking about investing, where you become a part owner in a company. So hence, you want to become, want to become the part owner of the world's best companies. It'll take a little bit of rigor, but you can find these companies. So the first portion of the fact analysis, which is the financial analysis, um, I'm going to look at a few figures from income statement. So what is the first thing I always look at? The first thing I look at is the total revenue. So the revenue, total revenue is available in the income statement, and I want to see that the revenue is consistently increasing. And in case of Adobe, it is consistently increasing. I'm actually just going to increase the size of my cursor. Hopefully it allows me. Oh, laser pointer here. So notice the total revenue of uh, Adobe has been consistently increasing, which is fantastic. Next thing I look at is the net income. This should also be increasing, but in Adobe's case, it's not increasing. It's been kind of up and down. So 2.9 million in 2019, then went to uh, 5.26 million in 2020. Next year went to 4.82 million, and then it went down to 4.7 six million. So when that happens, which means when the net income is not consistently increasing similar to the total revenue, then I want to look at within the net income within the income statement, I want to look at the operating income. So the operating income must be increasing if the net income is not. And look at it, look at it, Adobe. In Adobe's case, the operating income is, is nicely increasing. 3.2 million, 4.2 million, 5.8 million to 6.09 million. Fantastic. We also want to understand how much money a company is able to keep to pay for expenses or debt. So we can do that by looking at a couple ratios that can either be calculated using numbers from the income statement, or you can just find them pre-calculated on many websites like Morningstar. 
Uh, but what you should do is you should understand what these uh, ratios mean. So first ratio we want to look at is the gross profit margin. So what is gross profit margin? Well, it's a profit margin based on gross revenues. So it shows the proportion of revenue a company is able to keep after paying its expenses from manufacturing processes or cost of goods sold. This does not include, include expenses such as taxes, interest on loans, and dividends. Those are that's another in, that's another uh, uh, ratio that I will talk to you in momentarily. So ultimately, gross profit margin shows a company's profitability rate, and its formula is gross profit divided by sales revenue. So when I see the gross profit margin, I want to compare. My goal is to compare it with the industry. So industry's profit margin where Adobe plays is 63.84. And I got that from investing.com. So you too can search any company investing investing.com and you'll see the industry averages in the gross profit margin. So when the industry average of the gross profit margin is 63.84, now we can say that, okay, how is Adobe doing? Well, Adobe's got Adobe's gross profit margin ranges anywhere from 85.03 to 88.19 over the past five years. So that is very good. And that's a very small range within which Adobe has been bouncing, ping ponging up and down. So that's good. The second thing I look at is the net profit margin. So what is net profit margin? It shows the percent of revenue a company is able to keep after paying all its expenses in the financial period. Remember, gross was before paying taxes and dividends, et cetera. This is after everything is paid. So these expenses consist of paying off debts, dividends, cost to buy back shares. Ultimately, the net profit margin shows a company's performance in a year. And what is uh, the formula for calculating that? It's net profit after taxes divided by sales revenue, and you can multiply that by 100. Now, as we get that, we clearly want to compare that with uh, the industry average. So again, go to investing.com, uh, type Adobe, look for net profit margin, and it'll tell you what the industry average is. So in this case, industry average is 4.27%. So when industry average is that, what is uh, the net profit margin of Adobe? Check it out. 28.69, 26, 40, 30, 27, which is significantly higher than the industry. And these ratios will very quickly start to show how strong is a company. Okay. So again, when I look at these ratios, they want to be consistent or increasing over the past five years. A slight variation here, there is okay, but it shouldn't be generally decreasing. And in, in Adobe's case, you can say it's fairly consistent. All right, next. <clears throat> The other ratios I want to look at are current ratio. So what is current ratio? It shows the company's ability to pay its short-term obligations uh, or those that are due within one year, right? So current ratios formula is current asset divided by current liabilities. So whenever you use the term current, it means anything due within a year. So current assets are uh, even like accounts receivables, for example, the money that's about to come in within a year. And, account, and current liabilities are like accounts payables, wages payable, taxes payable, short-term debts, or any current portion of a long-term debt that's all paid within to be paid within one year. That's called current liabilities. So you take uh, current assets, divide that by current liabilities. If the answer is greater than one, it means assets. There are more current assets than the current liabilities, and that shows that this company can survive. So current ratio should be greater than one, right? I said current assets should be greater than current liability. So in case of Adobe, the answer is 1.1, which means yes, current assets are greater than current liability. So that's a check mark. I say good. The second thing I look at is debt to EBITDA ratio. Uh, in Adobe's case, it's uh, 0.66, but what is it? So it's a ratio that shows how long it'll take a company to pay back all its debt before the company pays interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization expenses. And the total debt is the sum of current debt and the long-term debt. And EBITDA, EBITDA, not EBIT. EBITDA means earnings before interest. Okay, here, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. So it's just an acronym, which sounds very fancy. And uh, this EBITDA figure is also available in the income statement. So you basically take total debt divided by EBITDA. This figure must be less than three. And in Adobe's case, it's very less than three. It's only 0 0.66. So that means the total debt is only 66% or is uh, of the EBITDA. And uh, that is fantastic. 
The next ratio I look at is the debt servicing ratio. So debt servicing ratio shows the percentage of total debt. Um, uh, sorry, so this ratio shows the percentage of operating income available to pay interest, interest on, on the debt. So the formula of debt servicing ratio is net interest expense divided by cash flow from operations multiplied by 100. So this figure has got to be less than 30, which means the net interest expense should be no more than 30% of all the cash flow the company is receiving from operations. This also shows the health of a company. Last thing I want to look at when it comes to uh, uh, these ratios is return on equity. So return on equity shows how much profit uh, a company generates from every dollar of capital in its shareholders' equity. Remember, shareholders' equity is the total money a company will retain or return to its investors if the company were to be liquidated after paying off all its debts. This means if the shareholders' equity is essentially the money that has been invested by the shareholders. And that is why return on equity shows the percent profit a company can earn based on every dollar invested by its shareholders. So you, when you invest, you're ultimately going to be a shareholder. So you also want to see that this company has good return on its equity, right? Because you're also going to own equity. So if the return on equity is not good, why would you want to invest in it? So this the ratio also helps investors understand how efficiently a firm uses the capital to generate profits. So, uh, just a quick rule of thumb, because these companies belong to, are are part of certain countries, right? Like, so Adobe is an American company, and we are investing in America. So, stable economies like Canada, America, UK, Australia, their average historical return on equity has been anywhere from ten to twelve percent. So. If I invest in a company, I want to make more than 10 to 12%. So I feel very satisfied that if a company's return on equity is greater than 12 to 15%, I would say it's great. So greater than 12 to 15, I'm a very happy person. What is it in, in uh, for, for Adobe? Let's have a look. So return on equity for Adobe from 2018 to 2022 jump bounces anywhere between 29% to 44%. Fantastic. And uh, the industry average is 21.62. So industry average 21.62, Adobe is doing really well uh, in that industry. And as it is, it's doing well because I want it greater than 12 to 15%. So this checks that mark as well. Okay, next thing I want to look at is cash flow from continuing operations, also known as cash flow from operations. So this shows all the money that has come into a company in the form of cash. So cash flow from operation should be positive and be increasing. And this is, where is it available? It's available in the cash flow statement. So in case of uh, Adobe, the cash flow from operations has been growing. 2019 was at 4.4 million, then went to 5.7, then 7.2 and 7.8 million. So fantastic, it's a, it's a linear growth, I'm happy. The next thing I look at is free cash flow. So free cash flow shows the cash that is generated by a company that is free of all internal and external obligation. And in essence, like this is money that's just sitting in a company. And this money should be positive. It shouldn't be negative. Otherwise, what happens is the company's cash reserves are going to keep reducing. So if it's like, let's say if it's going down, so cash reserves are going to start reducing the company will have to take on more debt to just do things in the company. The company could also raise equity, which means they'll sell shares. And when they sell shares, they increase the number of shares in the market, which increases the supply. When the supply goes up, the, the demand goes down and hence the price goes down. So these are all not good things. So you want to see the free cash flow of a company also positive. Thank you, billions. Yes, billions. I, I appreciate it. Uh, all these numbers are in thousands. So it's... Uh, 4 billion, 5 billion, 6.8 billion, 7.3 billion. Thank you for pointing that out. So next is advantage over competition. So remember fact analysis, second acronym is A. So A stands for advantage over competition. So whenever you invest in a company, you want to look at uh, that what is the competitive advantage this company offers so the competition doesn't come in and take its share away. So in case of Adobe, what would that be? So number one, brand recognition. So Adobe is I think the undisputed king of graphic design software. Uh, 
And their Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Premiere are taught in almost every graphic design school and video school. Adobe Acrobat is used to read PDF documents worldwide. So their software is used by almost every person. So their software is used by almost every person. So consequently, whenever someone has a need to do design work, uh, the product that comes to the top of their mind is Adobe. So this causes customers to pick Adobe, even if there is a strong competitor in the market, right? Like somebody asked me, hey, I want to do some graphic design. The first thing that's going to come to me is, oh, okay, let me go use Adobe Photoshop. But if somebody says, oh, there is another product out there, I'll think twice before doing that because I'm like, I'm already satisfied with Adobe and I have understood it and I learned about it. So that's brand recognition. The second is barriers to entry. So see, new companies try to obviously put pressure on, on Adobe primarily by reducing prices, right? Because Adobe is such a big company, they have so many products. So when a new entrant comes, what do they do? They will put, they will reduce their price to compete with Adobe. But Adobe has managed to build effective barriers by integrating personalized content such as analytics, web experience management, cross-channel campaign management, and uh, social capabilities all on one platform. This bundle of products can be offered by new companies or newly established companies. This whole ecosystem uh, is very difficult to compete with. So that becomes a barrier to entry. The next is use of substitutes. So product substitution I find in the software industry is, is kind of difficult. So many users end up building their business models, or even like companies end up building their business models on Adobe's products or the or the, or the the backbone of Adobe. And uh, essentially that uses them to differentiate their services from others. So a substitution by a company like that who's been using Adobe and, and, and it's integrated in the fabric of the company, it, it becomes very time consuming and costly for that company to switch away. And this kind of an effect actually happens in a lot, lot of software companies. And that also happens in Adobe. And last is competition. So the competitive landscape in the industry is consistently evolving with new products and solutions being developed to capture new market opportunities. Adobe was able to successfully compete against its rivals by offering a very comprehensive set of solutions that put it far ahead of its competition. And this advantage helped them secure significant share of marketplace while limiting their uh, opponent's potential growth, growth. Many times Adobe just, you know, even buys companies. And today I'm going to talk about one such acquisition. And remember, one more thing is that Adobe's got over 100 products and it has over 8,000 products patterns, which makes it very difficult for competition to enter into their territory. So when you're investing in a company, you want to look at this, that what is it? How can somebody else come? So if, if you feel like the company company's financials are strong, but it's vulnerable to competition, then you would say, okay, well, that may not be the best company for me to invest in. Now, one way to understand if a stock is at a good price is to look at what's called price to earning ratio. Okay, so this formula is very simple. It's a share price, and you divide that by earning per share. And EPS, et cetera, is all available on online. You can find it on Finviz as well. So the earning per share of, uh, uh, in this case, like I'll just bring you an example. So here's a chart I found on uh, fool.com, and it's uh, almost like latest. So as of now, the earning per share uh, ratio EP, uh, the, the, sorry, price to earning ratio of Adobe is 29.54. What that means is that the Adobe Adobe's share is actually 29.54 times the earning per share. So if the company earns $1, the price of share is 29 times. Or in other words, you have to spend $29.54 to earn $1 profit per share. So if the earnings per share remain the same as they are today, it'll take 29.54 years for an investor to earn the amount of money they invested in that stock. So my question is, that seems pretty ridiculous, right? So is 29.54 high or low? Well, the thing is that depends. It depends if the company is expected to grow, then this is okay. But if the profits are not expected to grow or if they're expected to reduce, then this is not good. PE ratio is not the best indicator 
of the potential of a stock because it doesn't take into consideration the growth of the stock that I just mentioned. Therefore, this is not a ratio I like to use to value stocks. Instead, I like to use discounted cash flow, which I'll talk about in a bit. But the historical price to equity, price to earning ratio, the historical price to earning ratio, like I, what I'm showing here on a chart, can help us very quickly to understand the value of a stock compared to its historical price. So for instance, in this chart, you can see that the current PE ratio is 29.54, but the average is 51.47. So this shows that right now, based on the historical PE ratio, Adobe stock is underpriced. That's a quick way of just checking without any doing number crunching. So if you just want to quickly look at it, just open this chart and have a look. So I've already done the intrinsic value calculation. For those of you who have attended our webinar, I go through in a lot of detail of how to do it, but I'll just quickly walk through the intrinsic value of this uh, stock. So uh, this is the DCF calculator that you can download from our website. And uh, the one that I used here has already been updated as of February based on uh, some of the latest market trends. So Adobe stock, so the growth rate, I use it from three places. So I've used uh, Finviz, Zacks, and Simply Wall Street. And I've taken the, the in, uh, analyst's growth figures for the next five years of the company, and then I've averaged them. So it's 13.68. And the system will automatically calculate the growth rate for six to 10 years and 10 to 15, 10, uh, and 11 to 20 years. Then the beta value is in Finviz. So I got that to be one, I found that to be 1.25. So I plug it in here. Uh, when I was checking the stock price this afternoon, it was hovering around $350. So I plugged that there. Number of outstanding shares in the company are 467 million. Operating cash flow is $7.8 billion. So that's why there are three other digits within this number after seven. Cash, cash equivalent and short-term investments is $6.096 billion. Short-term debt or current debt is $500 million. And the long-term debt, which is non-current liabilities, is $3.629 billion. Uh, current year is 2023. And when I project that, uh, it, when I enter this information, the system, uh, this calculator immediately shows me that the intrinsic value of the stock based on these figures is $402. And this intrinsic value, remember, keeps changing based on the acquisitions company is going to do, based on the analyst forecast for the company's growth, et cetera, and even the cash flow from operations, et cetera. So as they change, this keeps changing. Uh, so hence, it's, it's good to do this analysis every once in a while on a company. So you still know that it's in a, it's in a good condition. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a technical analysis on the stock. So I'm going to open up. Let's open up TradingView, www. So TradingView, I last uh, couple, couple a uh, few webinars ago, I went through TradingView and showed you how to use it. So it's free and I'll just use that again for technical analysis. So stock. Adobe sticker is ADBE. Here it is. So first thing that I want to look at in a stock is I want to zoom out and look at how it's performed over time. So I've zoomed it out all the way for as far back as TradingView can take me. And notice it started at 4.35 and then it just basically shot right up. It's been an exponential growth until this last year, 2022, when everything else fell. Adobe also took a hit and it fell significantly and it's now up. And these kinds of falls had happened in the past, but because the market cap continues to grow, uh, the previous dips over time don't seem that large. This also after a few years, or what the dip that happened in 2022, after a few years is also not gonna appear very big. But right now it's appearing, and that's why it's giving very good opportunity to purchase. So that's the first thing I look at. How has the chart performed? Has it been increasing or is it a cyclical chart which goes up and down and up and down? So no, this is clearly a chart that has gone up other than last year. And we've already looked at the advantage over competition. We've done the fundamental analysis using the financial statements. So we know that so far this company is passing. So next thing I want to look at is I'll go back to the one year and I'll see what's, hap what's been happening in the, uh, the stock. I'll close these off. All right, folks. So notice uh, the stock has been down. So no surprise, this is what happened to almost all the whole market other than energy stocks last year. So 
Adobe also went down. Went down from $479 roundabout all the way it was down to 274. So first thing I want to do is I want to start putting some supports and resistances. So I'm going to go here. And select a horizontal line. So I'll put a chart uh, line at the very bottom, which is the lowest point. Then I'm going to see how the stock went up. So there is another resistance that appears to be here. Then there is a resistance here. See why is a resistance? Because uh, it goes up and then it became a support. So it started to bounce here. Then that was just three hundred twenty-two dollars. Then there, it's currently right at a resistance or support level as well. So I can kind of look over here, check it out. So look at my red line. So right now the stock uh, stock had gone up, and then it bounced on this resistance, uh, sorry, support level, which was which had become a resistance previously, and it hasn't been able to go beyond below it. If it breaks this resistance, then the stock will go down. Uh, so first thing, because I had looked at what the company's uh, intrinsic value was, I'll just open that up. And this company's intrinsic value is $402. So now I'm going to go and set up a similar one of these at $402, which is here. So roughly around here, X coordinates, $402. I'll change the color as well so we can quickly see it differently. Line, perfect. Okay, so this line here, which is a solid green line, shows me the intrinsic value. So clearly the stock is below the intrinsic value. It almost touched the intrinsic value uh, on the third, on the 2nd of February, but then it went down, which also happens to be some kind of, there's a resistance of some kind. Other resistances that currently exist are, so there's one here. Uh, there appears to be one right here, right about here. And then some more. This I'm going to convert to back to red. And then, and then these steps kind of go up and go on and on. So right now, the stock is below its intrinsic value. It is no longer at the lowest. The stock had had touched the low point here, then it went up, and then the first, uh, this point, which was a uh, resistance, ended up becoming a support, then it went down. It broke that support, it became, uh, sorry, it broke that resistance, went up, and then it started bouncing between two support, a support and a resistance, like a ping pong ball. So it went up and down, up and down, up and down. Then it broke the resistance and went straight up to the next resistance point. Then it broke up that resistance point and went to the next resistance point, which also happens to be the intrinsic value. Then it went down. It broke this support level and went to the next support level. Now, it hasn't broken this support level, which seems like a strong support. So if it breaks this, it'll go down. What, as an investor would do at this point because this is below uh, the intrinsic value and it seems like a, it's clearly a good stock. Some more analysis is required, but if somebody were to add this stock, what they would do is they would predefine what, how much money they want to invest in the stock in a year. So if uh, they want to do 20 stocks and invest, I don't know, $2,000 in each stock uh, this year, they would take one third of the two of $2,000 and and put it down if they don't have a full allocation towards it. So they, this is a good time to buy it. And then you wait if until the stock goes to this level or the or the next level. So when it goes to the next support and the next support, that's when you start buying and adding additional uh, stocks. If it continues and carries on further up, then you just wait that I'm going to wait for this for it to hit our support and then I'm going to invest uh, more money into the stock. So you don't just blindly add. The other way is you could just say, okay, I'm going to just add money every three months. So right now it's a good time to add and you just carry on doing that blindly. But I think a bit of analysis is always a good idea. And I've just shown you that whenever it it comes down and hits up, it's a support level. That's a good point to say, okay, I'm going to add some more money. Then it goes down, I'm going to add some more money, provided that it is still below its intrinsic value.
In the world of UI design, which is user interface design, there are some key players that have existed. And uh, remember, I'd also mentioned I'm going to talk about an acquisition, so I'm getting to that point now. So we have Sketch, Figma, Adobe XD, Adobe Illustrator, and Adobe Photoshop. And this, this chart shows the market share of these companies. Now, Adobe clearly is a king of graphic design, video editing. But when it comes to user interface, user experience, Adobe is not doing very well. Let's have a look. So XD, AI, and PS, these are all Adobe products. And if you look at the, just around here, so this is where these first three lines, or the bottom three lines, they represent Adobe's market share. And Adobe's market share is not more than 25% of the global UI, user interface design market share. So th that's why Adobe wants to enter this industry even in a bigger way. So because it has been trying for last little while by enhancing its own capabilities and not getting there, but Adobe is very rich. So Adobe decided to buy the biggest competitor or the company that has the biggest market share. And which company is that? This company is called Figma. Figma has more than 75% market share of the UI design. This is the reason why in, uh, in September last year, Adobe announced that it's going to purchase Figma. And uh, when Adobe decided, it said, we're going to invest $20 billion, or in other words, we're going to pay $20 billion to this company and acquire it, which is clearly a lot of money. And you know what? Another thing that clearly happened is investors did not like Adobe's decision to buy Figma, and they didn't think this was a good decision. And why? what happened when, they did, when Adobe did this? So this was the September 14th when Adobe said, we're going to buy Figma. Look what happened to its stock. It went from here, from around roughly $365. It fell that the next day, all the way down and closed at $308. That was a huge fall in the stock that happened that day. But did Adobe make a wise decision or an unwise decision? So I want to analyze this with you guys. So Figma was purchased for $20 billion, right? But Dale's revenue of this company in 2022 was $400 million. So they bought it for $20 billion and the company is worth $400 million. So let me take out my trusted calculator and do some calculations in front of you. So if they bought it for 20 billion, and I'll I'll keep it in millions, so it's two and three zeros, uh, 20 and three zeros. So bought it for 20 billion, but the revenue is 400 million. So I'm gonna divide that by 400. So this means Adobe paid 50 times what this company actually produces in revenue, in, or at least produced in revenue in 2022. So Adobe paid 50 times for this company. And retail investors said, were you crazy, Adobe? Why did you do that? But Adobe's not, Adobe, Adobe's owners or the CEOs, they're not fools. They, they must have done some thinking. So what is the thinking they went through? Well, let's go through that thinking. We know that the price to sale ratio of Figma is 50 times, but what is the price to sales ratio of other companies? So what is the price to sales ratio of Microsoft? or Google or Tesla. So I'll tell you. So price to sale ratio of Microsoft is 9.56. You can check this out in Finviz right now. I can even open this. So here's finviz.com. So let's type in Microsoft. Here is the price to sale ratio. So price to sale of ratio of Microsoft is 9.32. What is that of Google? Google's price to sale ratio is 4.15. And what is that of Tesla? Tesla's price to sale ratio is 7.57, right? So in essence, these companies' price to sale ratio is yeah, anywhere from like 4 to 9.75, but, but uh, Adobe paid uh, 50 times for it. But our buddy, uh, Mr. Shantu Narayan, who hails from Hyderabad, and I don't know, maybe some of you are from there, this guy's not a fool. So why did he do this? See, folks, I have highlighted something for you. Figma has a total addressable market of $16.5 billion by 2025, which is now only in two years. In other words, Figma is expected to increase its revenue to $16.5 billion. 
knowing that the addressable market share is that much, which is 16.5 billion, I want to do some estimates and see if Adobe can actually recoup its investment. This is what the CEO was thinking. And you guys can think the same way. So assuming Figma achieves its target, which is $16.5 billion in, in revenue in two years, that means I take 20 divided by 16.5. That's 1.2. So if the if Adobe if Figma actually ends up achieving 16.5 billion as expected, then Adobe hasn't paid 50 times. Adobe would have actually paid only 1.2 times its revenue. So what if uh, Figma actually achieves less than that? What if Figma achieves 80% of what's expected? If it achieves 80% of what was expected, the price to uh, sale ratio in that case, the revenue of 80% of 16.5, so 0.8 times 16.5 is 13.2 billion. So if I take 20 billion divided by 13.2, that means at that time, Adobe would have paid 1.5x, which is still pretty good. If uh, uh, fin, uh, if this company is able to earn 50% of its expected revenue, then the price to sale ratio would be 2.4%. And if it only achieves 25% of the $16.5 billion revenue, Adobe would have only paid 4.8 times. And 4.8x is very close to the price to sales ratio of Google. So in other words, this price appears reasonable. But my question is, folks, can Figma actually achieve its targets or can it actually beat it? What was what else was Adobe thinking? Adobe must have thought of this. Let's do some more analysis. Figma that had a revenue of 400 million in 2022 with a growth rate of 150 percent. So this has been the previous revenue growth rate of uh, uh, of Figma. So Figma was able to achieve that kind of growth rate, but what did Figma have to do? Well, what Figma does is it actually charges low prices to its 4 million users, and it often gives many freebies so it can attract uh, users. If you go on Figma's website, you can actually see these right now. But when Adobe comes into play, guess what? Adobe has over 100 different products, and it has a very well-established user base of 26 million active users, right? So Adobe's got 26 million active users, whereas Figma only has 4 million active users. When Adobe combines with Figma, Adobe is going to expose all of its 26 million users to Figma. And also they're going to make Figma interoperable with Adobe's suite of products, which are many. And what's going to happen with that is there's going to be some cross-pollination that's going to happen. Some capabilities are going to be expanded or, or is shared. This is going to enhance the capabilities of Figma as well as enhance the interoperability experience of Adobe applications. So Figma, which currently has a growth rate of 150%, may grow two times uh, as much when Adobe's 26 million users are exposed to Figma's uh, 4 million users. And I personally feel that there's quite likely to happen. Of course, I don't have a crystal ball, but these are all estimates that that you know people like us can do. So if that happens, let's say right, Adobe starts to make Figma grow twice as much as what Figma was originally uh, expected to grow, then in that case, where in 2025, Figma could have achieved a $6.25 million, a billion dollar in revenue, with Adobe coming in, it could probably end up hitting $25.6 billion, which is $5.6 billion more than what Adobe has paid. Okay. And uh, I've also, in my calculations or these estimates, I'm assuming that Adobe is not going to increase the price that it charges to the users of Figma products. Whereas it's very likely that Adobe may increase the prices. And even if it increases by 10%, 15%, that's going to sig significantly start adding to the profitability or the bottom line of what the, the profits that come from Figma. Now, before Figma's acquisition, so this is, I ran through historic figures, the Intrinsic value of uh, Adobe was four hundred eighty-five dollars. Four eighty-five. So it was like here somewhere. And when uh, Adobe announced that it was going to buy Figma for twenty billion dollars, then twenty billion. Let me take my calculator out again. So what is that? So that's twenty 
billion, which is 20 and three zeros. And if I divide that by the number of shares that Adobe actually has, so which is 427 million. So at that time, that's how many shares they had. They did some share buybacks later on. So 427 million shares. That means if the Figma acquisition was a complete garbage, that means it take 20 billion, Adobe took $20 billion and burnt it. That means the intrinsic value of Adobe should have gone down by $20 billion divide by 427 million shares. And then that will show me what should be the intrinsic value uh, and or in other words, how low should the stock price have gone? So the intrinsic value of Adobe should have been four, should have gone down by forty six dollars. So my four hundred eighty five. So it should have been approximately around four hundred thirty eight dollars. So where is four hundred thirty eight? So even after this purchase, and if this if this company was a complete garbage, like basically Adobe burnt money. So Adobe's intrinsic value should have been around four hundred thirty eight dollars. Four hundred thirty eight. I'm writing with a mouse, so my handwriting isn't the best. And uh, even so, if the intrinsic value was $438, look what happened to the stock price. Stock price went all the way here. So at this point, if you, somebody were to just do some quick math, they were like, wow, this is a steal. People have overreacted for the purchase of uh, for this company. So why did the stock fall? It has nothing to do with the 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 productivity of the company, it has everything to do with emotions. So the stock's downturn at that point or this sudden downfall happened purely because of emotions. But based on what I've just shown you, Figma should increase the value of Adobe's revenue and Adobe's uh, stock price should increase significantly over the long run. And if it does end up recouping the $20 billion in two years, then Adobe's stock price should increase to $550 to $650 in the next few years which in other words is a potential and if that ends up happening adobe could adobe could see a growth of 130% in about 3 years from its lowest point which was right here which gives me a compounded annual growth rate of about approximately 32% from the lowest point in october so what i've shown you so far is how you analyze a company and how you also observe that if something if a company just buys something uh, how is that supposed to impact a company's stock? So if it gets impacted negatively, uh, why that happens? And then you can also do some estimations to if the, that if the acquisition ends up working out, where can the company go? Because these are the similar kind of thought processes that the company's CEOs, their CFOs actually go through. So, but there are some risks in uh, Adobe as well. So I've shown you that it's a great company to invest in, but so what are the risks? So here are the risks. Number one, high US dollars. Overseas revenues will decline as the US dollar strengthens because the purchase price of licenses will become more expensive. So let's say some company in Asia or Africa who wants to buy Adobe products, um, if the US dollar becomes more expensive then Adobe Adobe's licensing fees are going to become more expensive for those people and they may not buy it. So that can start to have a negative impact on Adobe's growth. So that's number one risk. The second risk is an inflationary risk. So as inflation increases, it also increases the cost of doing business for Adobe. For example, they'll have to hire people which are gonna cost more. They'll have to work with companies or consultants who are gonna charge more. So that just increases the cost basis. And when cost basis increases, either it reduces profitability directly or the company will have to increase its uh, price of licenses, which also can reduce the number of licenses that are being sold, which also cuts into profitability. So that's the inflationary pressure on the, on the company. And the third is product enhancement. So Adobe has to continue to evolve its applications to meet the changing landscape of people that who are working from home. So we've just gone out of COVID. Uh, Many people are still working from home. So what are the environments? What are the, the work processes? Now, uh, there are also several people who have now started to go back. So what is the changing landscape? So all these changes that are happening, Adobe's got to adapt to all that. So these are some of the risks that uh, I wanted to express to you. So the knowledge that I've shared with you is the same that our investment management company, which is Palm Team Capital, does before finding a great quality company to invest in through its hedge fund. And a lot of rigor goes into finding these great quality companies. 
of course, as you get better at it, it becomes very quick. Like it doesn't take me that long to do this analysis, but this analysis still is a great analysis to do. And uh, successful investors do not invest based on tips they receive from friends in a, in a bar. And they, they essentially end up spending time analyzing companies. So after they invest, and as I mentioned earlier as well, they can sleep with confidence that their money is invested in wise companies. So last year when we started our own hedge fund, uh, we were able to build a portfolio of great companies at very attractive prices. But you know what? Many of these companies at attractive prices are still around. So you can perform this analysis that I did today and consider creating a portfolio of about 10 to 20 companies and regularly invest in them through dollar cost averaging so that you can average in your positions or get better uh, cost bases. And you'll notice that in time, that your wealth is actually going to start growing. And since you won't be selling these positions, right, you're not trading. You, and so consequently, you're not going to be selling these positions. And if, since you don't sell these positions, you're not going to be hit by what's called uh, realized capital gains. And if there are no realized capital gains, then there are no taxes. So truly, you can enjoy compounding. And every month, my, I would like to, from now on, perform these kinds of studies for you. And I will, I'll bring in, I'll talk about a company. Some may be good, some may be bad, but I'll walk through the same thought process so you can see. This time I've used a discounted cash flow, which uses cash flow discounted over time, right? Sometimes we're going to use different figures based on how companies are, but I'm going to teach you those variations as we go along. Other thing is the last December, we delivered our very first comprehensive weekend long training program. Several of you may have attended. And we had a great turnout by delivering that course. What we want to do now, and I had mentioned that we're going to do that every quarter. So the quarter is coming up. So over the next few weeks, I'm going to deliver that course again. It's going to be a weekend long course, again, a very comprehensive course. And uh, it'll be delivered over two days, six hours in duration. And we're going to share many useful tools that we've created so that you can plan your own financial freedom. And you can even use those tools to calculate intrinsic values of large cap growth companies, understand how you can channel funds from a job, business, or trading into long-term investments. And I'm going to mathematically prove to you how long-term investments grow your generational wealth with compounding that is built into the stock market. Now, folks, we also have a Telegram channel. Many of you are already members of that. Uh, which uh, we have created so you can interact with us and seek help uh, from us with any of the doubts you may have. And over time, as our community starts to develop the critical knowledge, um, the members will even start helping each other. Lastly, if you haven't already done so, please join www.palmteamfoundation.org so that you can watch uh, many recorded videos, even monthly market insights that are produced by Jason, who's our investment manager in Palm Team Capital. Uh, he puts a lot of rigor in producing these uh, monthly market insights and Palm Team Capital donates them to our foundation, which makes it available to all you fine folks. So this page that you're seeing right now has a QR code. If you're not already a member of our Telegram group, just scan this QR code and become a member of the Telegram, it's free. Many ways of you to contact us. You can contact us by going on our foundation's website. Uh, you can even follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, that information is here. And that's it, guys. Hope you enjoyed and learned something new today as I yeah. had fun talking about it. And a minute, if I could pop on really quick, you mentioned those market insights that Jason produces. Um, we've actually got uh, the February uh, insights that are coming up probably on Friday. They'll be posted on the palmteamfoundation.org website. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, he's got some great information for you this time around. So appreciate you mentioning that. Thanks, Amit. No problem at all. And then, guys, uh, we have very smart members of our team. So as you guys ask questions, because I am presenting, I'm unable to look at all those questions, but I have team members here, Ethan, Jason, Zach, Nathan, they're here to answer. And they're very, they're very experienced in the same kind of things that I talk about. Uh, so with that said, everybody, thank you. I hope your questions have been answered. Uh, we'll be back again in a couple of weeks again, and I'll present something new. But as I mentioned, two things are coming up. And there's also a surprise coming up very soon, uh, which a member of this community is actually working on. So hopefully I can announce that to everybody in the, in the coming weeks. Thank you so much for your time, everybody, and good night.